Support for this program is provided by the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting and from viewers like you. Hello and welcome to Louisiana Public Square. I'm Beth Courtney, president of LPB. And I'm Shauna Sanford. Well, in less than two weeks, Louisiana voters will go to the polls to elect their congressional representatives, one from each of the state's six district, districts plus one senator. While much attention is being given to the possible power shift this midterm election could create in Washington, tonight we will focus less on the race and more on the issues. A good plan, I think. <laughs> well, the seven individuals who will represent Louisiana in Congress head to the job at a time when the nation is facing significant challenges, both at home and abroad. Congress also faces tremendous unpopularity with an approval rating of less than 13 percent. Tonight, Louisiana Public Square explores what issues matter to voters this midterm election and what should be Louisiana's congressional priorities. On November 4th, voters from Louisiana will be choosing the state's next congressional delegation. While the election has been receiving national attention as a battleground race for control of the Senate, less consideration has been given to the issues. Um, we want to take a deeper look and see what the landscape is among the electorate. Who's interested in the election? Who's paying attention? Um, what kind of things are they thinking about um, when they think about who they might vote for in the fall? Mike Henderson is the research director for LSU's Public Policy Research Lab. His group conducted a statewide survey on the midterm election in August. So we surveyed just over 1,000 uh, Louisiana residents. Of those, close to about 900 reported being registered voters. Um, the demographics of the sample match uh, known Louisiana demographics and socioeconomic uh, factors pretty well. Rather than asking an open-ended question about what matters to them, the survey gave voters a list of topics to rank. So easily at the top was the economy um, as the most important. A um, little bit behind that was foreign policy and national security. And there was a little bit of a drop, and then you get a couple paired right next to each other, um, the Affordable Care Act and then the federal budget deficit. At the beginning of October, President Obama spoke to students at Northwestern University about the economy and indicated a renewed push for a raise in the minimum wage. If we raise the minimum wage, we won't just put... We won't just put more money in workers' pockets. They'll spend that money at local businesses. But Dr. Robert Newman, chair of the economics department at LSU, says such a move is bad for the economy since it discourages the hiring of low-skilled workers. It has the perverse effect of actually increasing the poverty rate. What it does is transfer income from one group of low-skilled, low-income workers to another group of low-skilled, low-income workers. So it doesn't reduce the, the level of poverty, and it certainly doesn't improve their uh, well-being. The next Congress may also be addressing the gender pay gap. The National Partnership for Women and Families recently ranked Louisiana as having the worst wage gap for women, 34 percent less than men on average. But Dr. Newman says the report hides more information than it reveals. What it doesn't take into account is a significant difference in the occupations that women and men choose to enter. Um, so once you take all of that into account, uh, most of that gap disappears. When it comes to foreign policy and national security issues, the battle against the Islamic militant group ISIS is the most pressing. At the end of September, the president carried out airstrikes against the group without congressional approval. Obama has ruled out the use of ground troops, but a CNN poll finds that 75 percent of Americans see this as inevitable. So you're not going to see this massive buildup and, and, you know, a large ground invasion. What you would more likely see is something akin to, you know, special forces, small groups of soldiers being used, uh, although we're probably a little bit far away from that. 
LSU political scientist David Sobek says the next Congress may also need to address continued tensions between Ukraine and Russia. You know, a lot of natural gas goes from Russia through the Ukraine into Europe, uh, and so there's a large economic impact there as well. And sort of Europe itself is struggling to still pull itself out of the, the Great Recession, and so, you know, a hit to its you know, energy supply, uh, particularly Germany, would be sort of dramatic. A problematic rollout of the Affordable Care Act has left 58 percent of Louisianians with an unfavorable view of the law. But Doug Wilkinson with the Louisiana Health Care Education Coalition says the state's uninsured have seen some positive results. Well, in Louisiana, we had, in 2013, we had 489,000 people that were eligible for health care. They were basically uninsured, and they were eligible for the marketplace. We've had 101,000 actually signed up and get a plan. Wilkinson says new open enrollment starts November 15th, just months before the penalty for uninsured individuals increases. If you don't get coverage starting 2015, January 1, 2015, it's $325 per adult in the household or 2 percent of your income, whichever is higher. In 2016, the employer mandate kicks in for small businesses. Firms with 50 or more employees that don't offer health insurance will be penalized $2,000 per worker. According to the Small Business Administration in Louisiana, small businesses account for 97.5 percent of the state's employers. Louisiana's next congressional delegation will be facing a $649 million deficit and $17 trillion debt. Social Security and Medicare are the two largest so-called entitlement programs, accounting for more than one-third of the federal budget. Dr. Newman. For sure, the Social Security program is not sustainable without restructuring the program in terms of put, uh, deferring the retirement age uh, and things like that. So it's going to require that at some point Congress has to come to grips with these entitlement programs because they're not sustainable. Brenda Hatfield, president of AARP Louisiana, cautions that half of Louisiana seniors rely on Social Security as their only source of income, so it needs to be protected. To address Medicare costs, she says Congress should look at coordination of services as well as the practice of pay for delay by drug companies. Pharmaceutical companies will pay generic producing companies to delay putting generics on the market. We think that Congress should really look at that. An example, Lipitor. For nearly two years, it was off the market as a generic because of pay for delay. So that's one of those issues we need to keep in mind. No matter what issue you're most passionate about, Dr. Sobek says you should make your voice heard on Election Day. It's our, it's our civic duty, right? And it is something that um, we sort of take it for granted, but it's also a right and a responsibility and something that, you know, millions if not billions of people around the globe can't do. You know, it, it is a very important part of what makes America America and what makes a democracy a democracy. And we certainly cannot stress enough how important it is for everyone to get out there and participate and vote. Now, we have a great studio audience tonight from the Baton Rouge area as well as Opelousas to discuss Louisiana's congressional priorities. They include representatives from the Republican and Democratic parties, college students, and journalists. We also have two members of Louisiana's Legislative Youth Advisory Council from Alexandria and Gonzales. Welcome, everybody. Looking forward to tonight's show. Well, this month, LSU's Public Policy Research Lab surveyed citizens from around the state about this month's topic. Now, the top five issues named as the most important by folks who plan to vote in the midterm election are health care, the economy, education, social security, and Medicare. The middle five issues were terrorism, the federal deficit, gun policy, foreign policy, and immigration. And the bottom five issues were energy, coastal restoration, the gender pay gap, same-sex marriage, and climate change. Now, that varies greatly from what we just saw in the backgrounder piece, so we're going to start right there. I want to hear from you. What do you feel are the most important issues that our congressional delegation should really focus on and put their time, energy, and effort into? And, Josh, let's start with you. 
Well, I definitely think that education and healthcare are my two biggest issues that I'm concerned about mm -hmm. um, upcoming and to the next Congress. Mm -hmm. um, I believe the healthcare system in Louisiana is very unique. Um, I, I don't believe that it was disrupted by the Affordable Care Act. I believe it's disrupted by the governor. Um, he didn't accept the Medicaid dollars and he has basically shut down the public hospital system. Um, with education, I mean, it's so evident that the cost of education is rising dramatically. I mean, or drastically. I, uh, and you're talking about college education, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, while I've been at LSU, I mean, it's, it's risen a thousand dollars since I've been there. Um, you concerned about how much debt you're going to have when you graduate? Oh, yeah. I mean, I already have a more student loan debt than I'd like to mention. And, you know, I work and I shouldn't have to worry about what I'm going to do after college. Mm -hmm. um, I, I should be focused on making good grades and being successful after. And I shouldn't have to worry about student loan debt. Well, you're not alone because there are a lot of students out there who are very concerned about that very issue. Missy, what are you concerned about? Well, um, I was thinking about education as well, but just K-12 and higher education because I work in higher education, so mm -hmm. I see students getting out with lots of loans. But I, I was wondering, you know, what can our congressional delegation do to get more funding into our state for education at all levels, for financial assistance, um, for programming? and and not have it tied to things, not have it mandated, not have the strings attached to it. Give it to the state and then let the state spend it like we feel like it needs to be spent for our, our children and for our, our young adults coming into the college system. So. When you say not tied to things, are you referencing Common Core? Well, that's one of the things, but you know, it, every time we get something on our campus, it's always, it, it's never unrestricted to use what we need it most for. It's always tied to something. Mm -hmm. And so, if they could give the money to the systems, let us figure out what we want to do with them or what we need most, and then do that because I think that would better serve the students at all levels, K through higher ed. Mm -hmm. so. Kermit, you are with the Republican Party. My well, I am. I am a Republican. Yes. Okay. Uh, my concern is the overregulation has really stifled a lot of economic development here in the U.S. I particularly work with the chemi mostly chemical plastics refining industries uh, with smaller companies and uh, and uh, for instance one company based in Rhode Island cannot start manufacturing a new uh, product made 100 percent out of renewables even though they passed all the toxicity testing because the EPA has not approved it in, fi in five years. Mm -hmm. Every previous administration, 90 days minimum, that would have been approved. What is it that you want to hear these candidates say that you haven't heard yet concerning I the issue that you're most concerned about? I want them to roll back. It's such a labyrinth, all the volumes and volumes of regulation. A small company doesn't have several floors of attorneys and, and people like that to go through all this to figure out whether they're within legal bounds or not. So. How can you not be a foul of the law if, if, if you don't have that? Well, um, we're really fortunate to have some young people here. It's always great to get their perspective. And Sarah, we want to hear from you. Tell us your, where you're from and uh, what school you attend and what grade you're in and what you're most concerned about. Um, I'm Sarah Laborde. I'm from Alexandria, Louisiana, and I attend Holy Saver Menard Central High School. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the issues that I'm really concerned with is the overspending that our government seems to have. I feel like if we set a budget, we need to stick to it. And instead of overspending, we need to see how we can cut back to where we can stop spending and going farther and farther into debt. Dwayne, what about you? Well, my name is Dwayne Bell. I, uh, I attend the Math Science Arts Academy East. And I'm 16. I'm a junior. Uh, and for me, there are a lot of issues affecting our, our society today. So it's, it's kind of hard to come to one uh, conclusion. Issue? Yeah. yeah, there's so many. Exactly, but um, just what I, what I want to see out of the next Congress is just ladders of opportunity provided to um, more Americans. Yeah. I like the idea of health care being provided to more uh, Americans because what is it now, eight, 8 million, over 8 million now who are uninsured now have health care. I like that. Um, and you're paying close like attention idea. to it. I, I am, because because yeah. I have I have family members. My father passed away last year from a heart attack. He didn't have he didn't have health care. Hmm. I, I feel as if 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 that if he would have had the health care he needed, mm -hmm. 
he probably could have survived. Yeah, so that sits very close to home for that, you. That does sit close to home. Elizabeth, you're hearing uh, what folks are saying. You cover this. This is you are a journalist. You're with The Advocate. So tell us, what do you make of what you're hearing? Um, I definitely, you know, talking to uh, voters, potential voters, it definitely seems to kind of mimic the um, LSU research. A lot of people are really focused on the economy. And I think for a lot of people, a lot of people know somebody who has lost their job, mm -hmm. who's unemployed right now, has been unemployed and can't find work. But even even people who are employed, they're noticing they haven't been getting raises like they had been used to up right. until um, the recession. And so I think that people still aren't feeling that things are getting better and they are frustrated with that and they want some improvement in the economy. And just as a reporter who's covering this, any shortage of finding people who are willing to share and talk about what they're concerned about? No, no shortage. No shortage. No, none whatsoever. <laughs> Another reporter, Cole, uh, you're with the uh, Times-Picayune. Um, what do you make of what you're hearing? Well, I agree. It's, it's the same things that we hear and uh, the types of things they're talking about seem to, to mimic what the the two major Senate candidates are also talking about mm -hmm. and the concerns that they have. Uh, the economy is the biggest issue and uh, the Affordable Care Act is tied to that, uh, at least in the minds of, of a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's been interesting to hear both sides make the case for, you know, Yes, people are concerned about their jobs and small businesses are concerned about the regulations, but then 8 million people now have health care. And somehow those have to be reconciled. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Jane, let's hear from you. You are with the Republican Party, correct? Yes, ma'am. I, uh, <laughs> I attend LSU. I'm a member of the College Republicans. Um, the main issue for me is job security in the economy. Uh, I'm a young voter. I'm a junior in college, so I have a year and a half left of college pretty much. And I'm really concerned about the possibility of if there's going to be a job waiting for me when I graduate. And mm -hmm. um, there are a lot of like social issues that come to the forefront during campaigns like this. You know, same-sex marriage, uh, life issues. For me, I'm more. I don't vote for social issues. I vote for the candidate that is going to ensure my job security and uh, the, the welfare of our economy when I get out of college. Well, help us to learn a little bit more about young voters and where they are. Are you typical? Are you atypical when it comes to using those factors to determine who you're going to vote for? Well, I think that I think I'm pretty typical. I mean, of course, young young voters are not we're not all um, ideologically aligned. Obviously, we're right. very diverse, right. um, <laughs> which I think is a, ver a very common misconception that all young voters vote the same. Mm -hmm. uh, we definitely do not. Mm -hmm. But I think that, um, <laughs> very true, um, but I think that all of us are very concerned about the economy because, you know, a lot of us have part-time jobs. I know mm -hmm. I do, and, I, and we spend time on internships and looking for other jobs after college. And really, it's just a matter of, you know, if, if that's for sure. I feel like in my parents' generation, it was very, you know, great chance that they were going to have a really great job waiting for them after college. For me, it's a little bit more questionable. And uh, I'm a political science major, so I might ha I most probably will have a job in government. So, you know, that's a little <laughs> iffy. But um, but still, it's just the matter of having a job after college. Okay, John, what about you? What are your top concerns? Um, I think that one that's commonly overlooked is the coastal restoration issue. Mm. Um, I think a lot of it stems from a lack of awareness. Um, I don't think a lot of people understand that if you looked at the coast as an economic asset, it would have hundreds of billions of dollars worth of um, value. Um, Why is that on your radar? Um, I'm in an, an organization at LSU in the Honors College called the Louisiana Service and Leadership Scholars Program mm -hmm. and so we examine Louisiana problems like chronic poverty or coastal wetland loss mm -hmm. um, and I'm from Shreveport originally before I came to LSU and so that was something that we read in a textbook but never examined in person um, and we've gone to the wetlands, looked at it, met with experts um, and the money that we need to finance the Coast 2050 plan um, which is tens of billions of dollars, is money that sim Louisiana simply doesn't have. Yeah. Um, so it's going to take someone from Congress, from Louisiana, to, to acquire those funds. Well, we love Shreveport. We were just there. They hosted our city. debate at Centenary. It's a wonderful city. I actually grew up there. So uh, yeah. love Shreveport. Sarah, uh, you're from Southern University. Yes, you are uh, VP of the SGA, is yes, that right? A yes, lot of initials there, huh? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I got it in. What are you concerned about? Um, mainly as the Student Government Association Vice President, I mean, it's really something to see your student body stressing over how they're going to pay all that student loan debt back. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's going back to Josh's comment. You, when you accumulate that much debt and then going back to what Jane said and you know that your major or, you know, in this day and age, you're not guaranteed to have a job that's going to be right there waiting on you yeah. and be, allow you to pay back that debt. I mean, you know, how do you put two and two together? 
Um, the main thing for student uh, for for Southern University students is that a lot of us come in on uh, aid from the government as far as uh, the Pell Grant. A lot mm -hmm. of people uh, take uh, benefits of the TOPS um, scholarship on campus, and so. I mean, if you don't have those avenues, and then we're all coming from um, middle class or lower class families, you know, your economic stance isn't really preparing you to pay that back. Well, you guys have laid the foundation for a great discussion tonight, and we have to take a quick break, but we're going to come back and get your thoughts as well. That's all the time we have for this portion of our show. When we return, we'll be joined by a panel of experts to further explore Louisiana's congressional priorities. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Louisiana Public Square. Tonight, we're discussing what Louisiana's congressional priorities should be going into the midterm election. Joining me now is our panel of experts. Jan Moeller is the director of the Louisiana Budget Project. He's an award-winning journalist, formerly with the New Orleans Times. Picayune State Capitol Bureau. Stephen Wagaspak is the president of the Louisiana Association of Business and Industry. Lobby is the largest advocacy organization in the state with more than 2,500 members. Dr. Pearson Cross teaches in the political science department at the University of Louisiana at Lafayette. His principal areas of interest are state, local, southern, and Louisiana politics. And Dr. James Richardson is a professor of economics and director of the Public Administration Institute in the E.J. Orso College of Business at LSU. Thank you all so much for being here tonight. Um, I know you had a chance to hear a little bit beforehand and they have really started us off on a great discussion tonight. So before we go to our audience though, Jan, we'll start with you. What do you feel should be the top priorities of the next congressional delegation? Uh, well, I think uh, the people in Louisiana were right to identify the economy as the top priority. And uh, the economy uh, you know, has worked very well for corporations, for companies. Uh, the stock market has done very well. The problem is it hasn't worked for a lot of people in the middle and the bottom of the income scale. So I'm not surprised that people are very concerned about that. And there are some things that Congress can do uh, about this. One of them, of course, is raising the minimum wage, which in Louisiana, if we raised it to 10, 10 an hour, as the president has proposed, would uh, give 360,000 people a direct raise immediately if that was done. We could also work to expand the earned income tax credit, which is something I think has bipartisan support on Capitol Hill, has been supported with, uh, by presidents from Ronald Reagan to Bill Clinton. And this is something that we could uh, do to help uh, make sure that people who, who work hard, play by the rules, can actually earn a decent wage and stay above the poverty line. Well, Stephen, let's get your thoughts. I mean, Jan just mentioned raising the minimum wage. Would your folks agree with that? Well, my thoughts on what Congress's priorities should be are a little bit different. I, I think over the last several years, we've seen the federal government really, you know, broaden its reach and really get into a lot of the daily lives of, of every you know, U.S. citizen. And I thought Kermit in the early uh, part of the program really mentioned it. The, the influx of regulations and mandates that we're seeing come from the federal government is a huge concern to our members. And so if I look at the congressional priorities, I think we would like to see the government start taking their, their tentacles off of the economy a little bit and let it grow and prosper the way that I think the, a healthy economy does. On the minimum wage issue, uh, our members have a concern with that. And I think the biggest reason why is because those people that it tries to help the most, our research shows it actually hurts the most. You know, if you raise that minimum wage, what's going to happen is you're going to end up making it harder for a small business, a small employer, to keep a lot of those employees, in, you know, employed. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, to be able to account for that, they're either going to have to hire less people or raise the cost in goods and services. And that hits people who are low income harder than anything. So we think it's a good intention idea with a really bad output. Okay, Dr. Cross. Well, I think there are a number of issues facing Congress, but the issue, it strikes me that it's time for some sort of a deal, perhaps a deal on uh, the minimum wage tied to changes in corporate tax rate, for example. Uh, if you'd lower the American corporate tax rate com that uh, that companies pay from 35 down to, say, an average of 25 or something, and then raise that minimum wage and then peg it uh, to a cost of living so it stays at a standard and doesn't start losing value. But I think just recently uh, the events in the news have suggested that we need the national government to be more powerful than ever to face the threats of Ebola coming in to, uh, you know, ISIS over in the Middle East and so on. We need an activist federal government and all the squabbling, <coughs> excuse me, that Congress and the President are doing are counterproductive. Yeah, and your thoughts? I wish I had a very simple answer, but it's <laughs> not. It's a very complicated answer. And that is, if you really want to make the government 
more efficient, more, more effective, you have to make things a little bit simpler probably. That means probably major tax reform, such as Pearson was saying, corporate taxes are out of kilter really, the way they encourage businesses to go overseas. They're not doing, the business is not doing anything bad, they're doing what essentially their, the numbers tell them to do. So I think you need to look at the tax system, which is extremely complicated and can be much simpler for large companies and also for individuals, middle class, higher income, lower income individuals as well. I think number two, you have to get past, we, we really have to get past the health care debate. People talk about we want to repeal and replace a, a Obamacare mm -hmm. and replace. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it, repealing it is not going to happen. Revising it can happen. But repealing is not going to happen because it's too complicated to just go back to where we were in 2010. It's not going to happen. We need to say, how would we revise it to make it a more effective system? And then I think on, on things like the minimum wage, I think the idea of the minimum wage is not going to end the poverty issue at all. It may help a few people. It could. And it, it will. It will. It will also hurt a few people as well. Typically, it's going to probably help more than it hurts. But it is going it's, it's to, and I think there you can make a deal on that. It, if you raise it real high, you're going to have real bad problems. You make it a small dent in it, even going up to, I think, John said, John said up to $10. That's not going to put the world, that's not going to be a major setback. But certainly it will have some bad effects for some, on some small businesses. And I think the other thing you discover is that in government, at the federal level, or at state level, local level, you do something, there are going to be some good sides and there are going to be some bad sides. And what you want to do is find that combination that it has more good sides, a lot more good in outcomes than you have bad outcomes. Okay, let's let our audience jump in. And Kyle, I want to start with you. What, are, what is your focus and what's your question for our panelists? I think everyone, is, everyone has hit um, the economy as a very central aspect of this congressional election. Uh, and I think a, a subset inside of that is this issue of income inequality. Uh, you know, here in the state of Louisiana, we seem to have this uh, odd juxtaposition. Uh, in that we're a very poor state, and we've been a, we've been a chronically poor state in terms of wages. Uh, however, we seem to always have an unemployment rate uh, either below or close to the national average. Now, I find it interesting that in a state that has an unemployment rate lower than the national average, there's so much systemic poverty. Now, that seems to me that there's a, a, a real inequality in wages. Mm -hmm. The simple fact of the matter that someone works 40 hours a week all year round and still lives in poverty uh, indicates that there's a real problem in the wages that they make. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, agreeing with Jan that the minimum wage along with the earned income tax credit expansion would be a great step forward. Jan, let's start with you because he talked about uh, income inequality and Dr. Richardson just uh, uh, made some comments about that. So what do you say? I, I agree with Kyle. I think uh, the minimum wage is important to raise. Uh, and I want to go back to one point. Uh, you know, people say it will hurt jobs. Thirteen states uh, in America raised their minimum wage on January 1st of this year, and they've actually seen faster job growth than the states that didn't raise their minimum wage. And there are a lot of studies that have shown, because a lot of states have done this on their own, and the idea that this is going to kill a lot of jobs, the, the real world facts on the ground simply don't bear that out. Long term, I think the answer to uh, addressing income inequality is education. I think uh, most people understand that. Uh, the states with the highest median wages are the states with the most highest percentage of people with college degrees. And so in this state, we've, of course, cut uh, state support for higher education by $700 million over the last six years. And I think so. so this needs to happen on two fronts. On the one hand, try to, to enact policies that help boost wages for people. Uh, you know, we have a lot of good jobs coming in uh, in construction and plant development, things like that, but we're still going to need people who are, are going to uh, work in restaurants, who are going to check out our groceries, and, and those jobs deserve to pay a living wage as well. Long term, I think there needs to be more investments in education, starting really at birth and going all the way through college. Well, Jan, you just said something, and I want to get um, Stephen and, um, and uh, Dr. Richardson here to comment on what he just m mentioned about states where they have actually raised the minimum wage 
in terms of job growth versus those states that have not. I mean, it flies in the face of what you've just said. No, healthy markets create healthy wages and opportunity. That, that, that is a firm belief that I have. If you look at some of those states, who knows what went into that. The, the reality is if you go down the road you know, on I-10 to Lake Charles, go down there, look at what's happening in the wages right there. Those wages are going up. It's because you have a healthy economy, you have a lot of investment. You've got over $60 billion in new investment going on in Lake Charles. What's happening is the entire community is benefiting. Not just those that are going to work in the chemical and manufacturing industry, but those minimum wage jobs down the road that are going to provide the food and services for that. All of those wages are going up because that market is healthy, it's growing, it's expanding. In the state of Louisiana, we've got about 250,000 new jobs coming over the next couple of years. 69,000 of those are going to be STEM-related jobs by 2018, according to LSU. That's science, That's technology, engineering, and absolutely. math, right? Absolutely. Those are all real uh, high-paying jobs coming in. If our students come out of school prepared for those jobs, they can go succeed. They're going to see their wage inflation go up. I think if we're competing in a global economy. If we steal investment and jobs from other states and other countries and bring it to here to Louisiana, you're going to see wage and opportunity go through the ceiling. I think that's the best way to raise wages. Dr. Richardson, do we have the workforce ready and available to take advantage of the jobs? I mean, immigration is something that has not come up yet, but it is of interest and concern to people. What about that? I think with respect to the do we have enough people, if, if the growth is as explosive as we have been talking about or thinking about, there's no way we have enough people in the state to handle all those jobs. We will import people, which is not bad, because we, you want us to grow, and you want us to grow as a state in terms of income, in terms of employment, in terms of population. We always, I always say the, the best goal for a governor is we should get back one of our congressional seats. Remember, we used to have eight. We had seven. Now we have six. Right, right. If the next governor got back to number seven, I would say that guy deserves a gold star <laughs> <laughs> because that's the way you really measure progress. We have really we are growing, and and that's not going to be because we're reproducing here faster than anybody else. It's going to be because we're having people move into the state because they say this is a great place, a great market. This is going to be something we have to do ourselves. I think from a congressional perspective, though, uh -huh. what do they do about it? Well, I I, I think to be quite honest very little. <laughs> it's going to be us doing that. I think on the congressional side, we don't want them to be in terms of prohibiting this or stopping us. On um, things like, you know, I think, they talked about the earned income credit, which is really part of tax reform, because it's part of the tax system. It is a special way of helping the working poor to be better off. That is a very strategic Go and as it was said, it was yeah, it was done by it was actually passed, I believe, at first under Nixon. It then was raised substantially under Clinton. It was moved up under uh, President Obama. It has been maintained by every Republican president. So it's been a part of the tax code for 45 years now. So and it's a great part of the tax code because it allows us to really do help people at, who are working hard, but they simply don't make, make very much money. Okay, let's go to Bambi. Your question. Well, I, all the issues that uh, were brought up tonight, of course, they're all important. Um, of course, the, the economy is very important. We need to remember that our state is hinged on oil and gas. Mm -hmm. um, all of my family works in oil and gas. Um, and that our senior <coughs> sitting senator is the chair now of the Energy Committee, mm -hmm. which, you know, that's very important, you know, that someone going in um, uh, in a in line that that you don't get that type of chairmanship so I think that that's really important for us to, to remember that we need to maintain our um, you know where we have in our oil and gas industry um, also I think with the health care that's really critical for um, for women uh, for for working mothers we have done a really good job in our state of making sure that our children have um, health care unfortunately we have not uh, expanded Medicaid so we have many of those 240,000 people who do not have health um, coverage um, or working mothers. Yeah. Um, so that's really critical to me. And so what's your question for the panelists? Well, I would like to um, know how would you propose that we um, can make sure that those people, those 242,000 is the number that I've heard, how can we ensure that those people have access to health care? These are working people yeah. um, that, that don't have that care now. Dr. Cross, you want to take that? Well, uh, the general administration, of course, has not expanded Medicaid, and it's estimated about 240,000 people would have at least uh, health care insurance. Uh, I want to touch on a couple of points here, and one of them is uh, about our community. You know, when we have these gaps, as Kyle was talking about, in income, uh, we, 
you know, there's great uh, income inequality. I worry that as a state, we're becoming two groups of people, the haves and the have-nots. Right now, they say that 40% of uh, female health, female-headed households in Louisiana are below the poverty line. That means children below the poverty line. And they may have health care, but this is a terrible situation. Four in 10 black children in Louisiana today below the poverty line. If we don't fix that, we can't fix Louisiana. You know, you, this idea that some people are winning and some people are losing, you know, we win and lose together. If we get to a situation where we are so divided by wealth and this gap gets so big, we're going to be in trouble. And if I could quickly make a note to uh, Mr. Wagsback, you know, he said that there are 250,000 jobs going to be created and 68,000 of those or 69,000 are in fact STEM jobs. Well, I'd like to point out as a liberal arts person that 181,000 of those are not and will be filled by people from the liberal arts. So. He can do math too. <laughs> Clifford, your question. I, I think as a, I'm a, I'm a business owner. Um, and so, yes, the economy is incredibly important. Um, I'm trying to grow my business, as all, we all are. But I think one of the things that drags it is we have a, a debt problem. We have a spending problem, both in the state and nationally. Now, in the state, the, the Congress really can't do anything about that. But I think in the uh, nationally, we need to get our debt under control. I'm talking about the deficit. That's coming down. But we need to do something where my children and my grandchildren are not having uh, a, a lifestyle that's going to be worse than me because they're going to have to struggle with how to pay that debt yeah. that and we so are accumulating. And so your question is? What, what should the priorities be for the Congress in dealing with that and getting some fiscal sanity, getting some fiscal responsibility? Yeah, John? I, I would uh, respectfully disagree with, uh, I mean, I have some good news for you, Clifford. The news this week was that our federal deficit is lowest it's been since yes. 2008. Um, Right now, it's 2.8 percent of GDP, and that's below the historical 40-year average. And the reason that is is because Congress has restrained spending. There was uh, the sequester, and they've also raised taxes on the wealthiest households. Uh, they did that in, in 2013. And when you raise taxes and cut spending, the government gets more revenue. The deficit shrinks. I think what we, the next Congress needs to focus on is how to reinvest in, in the American people and how to reinvest in things like good roads, bridges, infrastructure projects that can really spur the economy, spur long-term economic growth. Uh, I think we've really focused on austerity for such a long time during a, a recessionary time and during a very difficult recovery. And I heard, uh, I think it was the head of the Louisiana Chemical Association was quoted in the paper the other day saying, you know, we really need to propose kind of the biggest infrastructure uh, uh, program that this country, this state, has ever seen. And if you drive the roads in Louisiana, you'd probably agree that that's a, an area where we should be investing more resources. So I think we've focused, Congress has focused on the deficit quite a lot. That's been a big focus. I think the time is to come together and look at how we can reinvest and how we can raise the revenues necessary to make those investments. But Dr. Richardson, his question is about the debt. Yeah, yeah, what is, yeah, what, what well, I think, one, the deficits and the debt are connected. The debt is nothing but the accumulation of the deficit over many, many years. And as Jan was saying, the deficit is going down. It's going down, yeah, they raised taxes a little bit, they, they cut some spending, but, they, but the economy is growing. The best recipe to get rid of the deficit is to grow the economy really, really fast. Now I think this other side, on the debt side, I think sometimes that issue gets overplayed a little bit. You talk about the debt, you don't talk about the assets that are associated with that debt. And that could be a whole sorts of all of our infrastructure. So if you talk about a company, you talk about, about their net liabilities or their net assets. You talk about all their assets, less their debt, their liabilities. When we talk about the federal government, we just talk about the debt. I think we need to kind of broaden the conversation and say, okay, we can have too much debt. But on the other hand, let's get it under control. The debt is, is, is going to be, if we invest well, in certain things as a country. We may have a debt, but we have assets that are gonna also, your children will pay the debt, your children will also reap the benefits of those assets. So I think we have to balance that picture out as we think about it, and not just become all, all uh, focused on debt, debt, debt. Well, we have a lot of students here who are focused on debt, 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 and I know that they that you all do have questions about that. Josh, uh, Sarah, Jane, I know that you all have questions about that. Sarah, let's start with you. What's your question? 
Um, mainly, I spoke earlier about student debt um, and student loan debt and the pending trying to pay it after you graduate. And so knowing that here in Louisiana, um, it's kind of daunting uh, to try and find a job at our age, 21, 22, 23. Um, what would you suggest the congressional, uh, the next Congress should be focusing on trying to get us out of that debt? I would answer, and I'm sure others have answers as well. <laughs> I would say part of the element is the government sets up the system to encourage you to borrow, mm -hmm. and you borrow, and you have debt. Mm -hmm. Then you have to pay it back. Mm -hmm. The question is, should they encourage you as much as they're encouraging to have that debt? Or we should, should we find other ways to, to, to pay for our higher education mm -hmm. at this level? Which might mean higher tuition, it might mean more state support, the other, other ways of avoiding that debt as opposed to merely saying, okay, look, here's all these neat ways of borrowing, right. borrow all you want, right. and then you got to pay it back. The other side of that coin is to make sure that you, as you do through college, you do have that responsi responsibility for that debt, make sure you get that job. I wish I had gone to school in Topsis here, I'll tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> that is a great thing. Yeah, and so un unfortunately it wasn't in place, and so went to school and took out loans. So I, I, I hear you firsthand. And, and it's hard when you get out into that job force, you know, when you first get out of school and you're trying to find your way, you're trying to, um, you know, develop your own adulthood, if you will, and then you're dealing with the debt. I understand that completely. I went through it myself. What I would encourage you, and this is nothing against the liberal arts, they're a fine educational <laughs> degree, but, you know, there are a lot of great jobs coming into this state. There, if you want to stay here and pay off those loans, there's a lot of great opportunity coming here. I, w I would encourage you to, to find out what those workforce needs are, get that training and attack it and go do it. And you don't have to even have a four-year degree to do it. And so I think there's going to be great opportunity for people. You know, wasn't that long ago in this country, we were talking about the loss of American manufacturing jobs and the loss of U.S. jobs overseas. Now if you look what's going on in Europe and other countries, they're not developing their energy resources. They're refusing to use natural gas. We're benefiting from that. Our energy supply is allowing us to bring those jobs back to our shores. It, the best thing we can do in Congress is convince Europe to continue to put their head in the sand on these issues because they are driving jobs to our shores. And let me That's going to help our economy on that. Go ahead and, and get in briefly because we're going to move on to briefly, another topic. Just in terms of uh, uh, the amount of debt you have, you know, one of the things Congress could do is they could lower the interest rate on the debt, you know, mm -hmm. and they could consider that an investment in people who are trying to better themselves by getting a college degree. Mm -hmm. strikes me as inconceivable that we, we basically guarantee a profit margin to those people who supply money for people to go to school and if we're going to guarantee that profit margin it ought to be way down as far as I'm concerned so profiteering getting eight ten percent or whatever on student debt that's crazy well let's go to Elizabeth and let's talk about something that your question is about and that's about ISIS and uh, the military <laughs> <laughs> um, it was it was brought up just briefly but I am kind of curious what um, the panel thinks Lately, we uh, it just seems like in recent weeks we're starting to hear a lot more about ISIS and Ebola. Mm -hmm. um, it's really kind of grabbed national attention. So I'm just kind of curious, um, especially this late in the election, um, what impact, if any, will those two issues have? Yeah. You know, typically when a, when a an administration uh, has uh, national security concerns right at the right at the time of an election, it's a benefit for the administration because the administration can take action can appear strong, people rally to the f flag and so on. But in this case, uh, Obama's taken so much heat for his handling or lack of handling ISIS and Ebola and so on that, in fact, it seems to be working for the other party that there's this instability. Uh, in times past, in crises, you know, there's been this rally effect, but we're not seeing the rally effect right now, and it's kind of a little bit of a different thing in American politics. Yes. Uh, also, I think you hit on, there's certain things we say the federal government is in charge of. National security is one of those things. That's their responsibility. No state, regardless of how big it is, has that responsibility. And that's the National Guard. And I think on that situation, we have to look for them for leadership and for guidance. And we have this, and I think there you find it's kind of interesting that even in Congress, it's not a party issue. It's a philosophical issue that may trans jump over parties. And on how much effort should we be in the Middle East What's our responsibility? And I think that's a tremendous debate. And 
I don't think it's over yet. Yeah, well, and I think you've spurred you on, uh, <laughs> who has a comment now. <laughs> I would just say, I mean, if I were a member of Congress and, and looking at the Ebola crisis, I would say it's not my job to fix Ebola, or, uh, but it is my job to make sure the Centers for Disease Control has all the funding it needs mm -hmm. to do its job. I and mean, we have experts uh, who are trained in, in handling these kinds of things, and, and they need proper funding and they need support, and then I think they need Congress to get out of the way and, and let them do their jobs. Yes, yes, yes. If I could just follow up with that, I, mean, I am kind of curious just if it is going to have any impact here in Louisiana. It seems like a lot of this election has been, especially in a state that leans Republican, a lot of it has been against President Obama. A lot of the election has been running against Obama instead of necessarily running against the candidate mm -hmm. <laughs> who's mm -hmm. in the race. Mm -hmm. And it seems like these are two things that kind of have presented another opportunity for people to run against Obama <laughs> when they're running for Congress. And so mm -hmm. I'm just kind of curious um, whether any of you think that that uh, has the potential to resonate. There are some, and I would be one of them, who would say that when you look at issues like the Ukraine, if you look at issues like ISIS, if you look at issues like Ebola, there appears to be a tentative approach from this administration mm -hmm. on some of those issues. Mm -hmm. And that is a concern. And so I think in this election, that will come up. I think in those, in those moments of crisis, no matter what they are, if it's, a, if it's an overseas battle, if it's a disease that we can't issue, people want decisive action and they want to have confidence. I think that is a void that's not happening right now in these issues. And so, again, that's my personal opinion. Other people may view it differently, but I think that will be an issue in the election. Well, I would say one thing, on that. and I, Steve, I, I, Stephen's comment I, I agree with to the point, my only problem is what do you mean by decisive action? And I don't think we can agree on that. I don't think I don't think the Congress can. I don't think the American public. You look at the polls. The American public is very divided. And again, it's not by political party necessarily. It's not by region necessarily. It's by some sense of what should we be doing, and we don't know, and we aren't really sure how far we want to go and put our little finger in the water, okay, a little bit more, a little bit more, will we get pulled in all the way? I think people are very concerned about that. Very quickly. It, yes. it, it may be a little bit how the Supreme Court defines pornography. Yeah. I can't define <laughs> it, but I know it when yeah. I see yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, you know, talking about another topic where it seems people are running against the president, it's health care um, and the Affordable Care Act. You talked a little bit yes. about this earlier, and Kyle, I believe that you mentioned mm -hmm. something about this earlier as well. How does that factor into uh, the election in terms of setting the priorities for uh, our next congressional delegation. Dr. Richardson, you mentioned Obamacare, the Affordable yeah. Care Act, is not going to be repealed. Changes may be made, but it's not going to be repealed. But that is what we hear over and over and over again, that it's going to be repealed and replaced. Yeah. Well, if you read the polls, certainly in Louisiana, that's the popular line. Right. And I, I agree with that. I think as a practical matter, and I would imagine that there, if you're talking about repealing it, you're talking about going back to January 2010. Take all the rules off the books. That's pre-existing conditions. That's raising the age of people of children on, on their parents' insurance to 26. You got a whole set of list of things that are not, not going to be repealed. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's going to happen. It's going to stay on the books. Now, at the margin, there will be some changes in it. And indeed, probably, and I think this is where President Obama has made a mistake, he should have t embraced some of these changes and said, we want to make some changes, let's go, and then challenge the Republicans, here are some changes, do it, see what they would do. And I think in a certain sense, he, in that sense, they, they, they have not done that. So I think, yeah, there will be changes in it, but I think in terms of talking, to re you, you had 46 million people un uh, without insurance in 2010, you're now have reduced that by eight or nine million people. You're not going to put those eight or nine million people back on the uninsured side. Jan, right? your thoughts, yeah. I, I, I agree with Dr. Richardson completely. It's not going to be repealed. And, and what I've heard from the candidates is just that. They want to repeal and replace this law. And it's just not realistic, at least while this president is in office. Uh, and my hope for this <laughs> Congress, I don't know if I'm optimistic, is that they would find some way to find some bipartisan agreement on if they if they agree that there needs to be some fixes it's only going to happen with with bipartisan agreement and that's something that's been an extremely short supply on Capitol Hill uh, I remember when the parties used to come together on certain things that ha hasn't seemed to happen uh, the last couple of years but the fact is that uh, as long as President Obama has a veto pen 
the Republicans aren't going to have enough votes to override that veto, so the only way you get something done and signed by the president is if you find some common ground in the middle. Uh, I really would hope that that could happen. I'm not very optimistic that it's going to happen in the next two years, unfortunately. Yeah. Can, can I just say that although no law is perfect, we can't go back to the time when you know, a child couldn't be covered for a pre-existing condition or a woman could be charged more just for being a woman. Now, I keep hearing repeal and replace, but replace with what? Yeah. Exactly. There has been no plan proposed for to, to have uh, folks who are uninsured be insured. Mm -hmm. So that's just a question I have for the right. What is the replace part? What do you have uh, and, to replace and, and, and it? A couple yes. of thoughts on that. Uh, first of all, it, it, this bill wasn't passed in a bipartisan nature, so I think it's only natural there's going to be bipartisan mm -hmm. concerns mm -hmm. with it in, in, the, in the years going forward. The other piece is if you look at the very premise behind the bill, Basically what it does is it takes a look at the country right now and says, okay, we have an employer-based health care delivery model for the most part. And it says we, over time, are going to try to do away with that. And you see that with all the penalties and provisions and mandates that go on employers for doing that. It's almost like they're intentionally trying to discourage employers out of this business. At the same time, they want to expand the, the government delivery piece in order to catch those lives when they leave. Everyone wants more coverage. Everyone wants to give better health care to people. That is not really the question here. The problem is, as a country, we have more people on government programs than we do employed in a job. And we talk about the debt and all that. We're not going to ever dig ourselves out if we make massive investments in ways to get people off of private coverage onto government programs. It's a very expensive enterprise. Is covering lives the right thing to do? Absolutely. This bill is not the right approach to a lot of people. But who I are think not what there. Dwayne is saying, and I think what other people are saying, is that we're not hearing what you're going to do if you don't have this. I complex. think there's a there's a logjam of bills that have passed the House of Representatives and are yes. dead on Harry Reid's desk right now. That's correct. You can put, bring a wheelbarrow here and put them right here. There's a lot of alternatives. They've never seen the light of day. Dr. Wait, Wait, I think a couple of things. If you're really going to talk about repealing Obamacare or the Affordable Care Act, and and talking about government interference with the private market in terms of insurance and things of that nature. Okay, how about Medicare? That's where most of the people are. On Medicare, a 100% gov a government program for people of certain ages mm -hmm. and disabilities. That's, we are, nobody's talked about doing with that. We're going to keep it. Medicaid is a program for the lower income children, moms, who are without heads of other uh, uh, men head of households. We have a whole system of Medicaid, and no one talked about doing away with that. But we did hear in that piece that something has to be done in order to sustain yeah. those programs. No, well, I, on the sustain, I think that the sustainability is a very important issue because of the age, dis age changes mm -hmm. we're having, mm -hmm. the, dem the temple of demographics. The fact of the matter is, in, in the next 20 or 40, 30 years, many more people like myself, the older people, will dominate. <laughs> and we'll be looking for you younger people. already dominate. <laughs> Look for you younger people to take care of us, okay? Well, listen, speaking of younger people, because we are running okay, out on okay. time here, I want to go to Josh. Because, Josh, I think your question kind of has to deal with clout. Um, you're talking about, why don't you go ahead and ask your question and, and uh, let our panelists answer for it. All right. I, I was just curious what the panel thinks about um, which candidate will be able to best serve Louisiana over the next six years. Uh, Bill Cassidy likes to talk about uh, repealing Obamacare, and it's obvious that it's not going to be repealed. And haven't really heard much from him after that. It's uh, I want to know what he's for, not what he's against. There. What, so what about that cloud? How does that factor into the, the election? The cloud is the argument that Mary Landrieu is making to justify being reelected again. The idea that she's head of energy and commerce, and she's there at the table. Mary Landrieu is an oddity in the Senate. She is, uh, frankly, a fairly conservative Democrat, maybe the most conservative Democrat still left in the, in the Senate, because, as the Senate has become more polarized like the rest of the country. The question is, as is posed, would it be better to have a Republican Senate, even though we would lose, essentially for Louisiana, the chairmanship of that energy committee? And that's a, a judgment that people are going to have to make. Uh, the direction of the Energy Committee is not going to change that much because Mary Landry has been a pretty full-throated uh, proponent of expanding energy and, and doing everything she can to promote energy. So if you have a re Republican in that seat, you're going to get those same policies out of that committee. So not much is going to change there. But in terms of seniority, Mary Landry has been crucial at various times in getting things for the state. Sometimes she's been ridiculed for the effort, like when she got that $300 million as that side deal she cut. But other times she's really been in there slugging. But it could be that people in the state of Louisiana at the end of the day feel like a Republican Congress would more serve their interests. 
that's something people are going to have to decide in this election. Well, when you look at the top three candidates, we really go from one end of the spectrum to the other because we have Mary Landrieu, who has been there for many years and has lots of experience. Um, Dr. Cassidy, Bill Cassidy, has been there and has experience. And then you have uh, the uh, other Rob gentleman, Manus. Rob <laughs> Manus, thank you very much, uh, who has no experience. This is his first time, uh, first time jumping in. Um, so we've got the entire spectrum uh, covered there. Well, we actually don't. If we had a liberal Democrat, then you would have the entire spectrum <laughs> covered. I mean, from my point of view, you've got a, a moderate Democrat, a conservative Republican, and a very, very conservative Republican. So, uh, uh, but we do have the Louisiana spectrum covered. Yes, it we appears, do. And listen, know, we are speak. almost completely out of time, so I just want to wrap up and get some final thoughts and make them very brief. And Jan, we'll start with you. Uh, like I said, I hope the, the top priority for the next Congress is breaking the bipartisan, uh, the partisan log jam and, and hopefully find a way to help the middle class. Okay, Stephen. Uh, my, my short view is the global economy dominates. We are competing with other states and countries for jobs. And so I want whoever goes to Congress to have that firm in their mind when they think, how can they help Louisiana compete in a, in a free market? Mm -hmm. Dr. Cross? Regardless of who wins the Senate, I think that the next two years shouldn't be wasted. We have serious problems facing this country, and we need to come together to the extent and get some deals, get something up on Obama's desk that he can sign that we can all live with. Dr. Richardson. If in, in, in the final two, two years, the next two years, Congress, if they really do some good jobs, wanna, I'd like to see just one bill passed. Uh, okay. <laughs> that that takes a, it's non, a non a bipartisan bill. We pass that one bill, but I really think they they really should come together and talk very seriously. Okay, we have a health care system. We've got to take care of it. Let's figure out how to re revise, how to adjust. Let's do it right now. Let's not wait for another president or another congressional district another election. Let's do it right now, as opposed to. Uh, just being at loggerheads all the time. Well, I knew we were going to have a great discussion. Thank you all so very okay. much, and thank you all. It's been wonderful. We are completely out of time for our question and answer segment, but we would like to thank all of our panelists, Jan Moeller, Stephen Wagespach, Dr. Cross, and Dr. Richardson for their insight on this month's topic. Now, when we come back, we'll have a few closing comments, so stay tuned. Well, Shauna, just like the other night at the Senate debate, <laughs> much longer conversation could be had on all these topics. Oh, yeah, no shortage of opinions here tonight, and people are very focused on the economy. A huge, huge topic for folks here that we learned tonight. Healthcare, debt, student debt, very, very big. I hope the candidates are watching and listening. Well, but we didn't talk about some of the things that are in all the commercials, uh, certainly illegal immigration, yeah. closing the borders. We didn't talk about any of the big social issues that come up in all the commercials. Of course, one of the joys of public broadcasting is we don't have any of the political commercials. <laughs> and that's all the time we have for this edition of Louisiana Public Square. We encourage you to visit our website at lpb.org slash public square. While you're there, take this month's survey. View additional sound bites and comment on tonight's show. We would love to hear from you. And don't forget, in addition to the choice for representative and senator, there are 14 proposed constitutional amendments on the ballot as well. You can find more information on our webpage. That's right. Well, in Louisiana, nearly 15% of students who enter high school drop out, and only 72% graduate on time. Join us next month as Louisiana Public Square brings together teachers, policymakers, and innovators for destination graduation. Thanks so much for watching and have a great night. Good night, everyone. For a copy of this program, call 1-800-973-7246 or go online to www.lpb.org. Support for this program is provided by the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting and from viewers like you.